Initially, permaculture was conceived very much as an agricultural movement. But the word permanent, permanent culture incorporates both permanent agriculture and culture. And I think that's the focus of my talk today, is the people component of it. And looking at how we identify ourselves with inside this very rapidly growing worldwide movement. Um, but to put it very shortly, it's the conscious design of human life support systems. So what we do is we have looked at how ecosystems or nature, because even the word nature now is a, um, is a questionable word, how ecosystems are put together, what makes them function. And we take those principles and we apply them to creating human ecosystems that can function similarly. Um, and I think one of my favorite statements about problems, because the world is seen as being riddled with problems and problematic and challenging and quite frightening and we can feel quite disempowered in it, is the problems of the world are becoming increasingly complex, but the solutions are always stupidly simple. So simplicity is really important. We've got extremely caught up in complexity and expensiveness and difficultness to solve problems, whereas we can actually reduce it to very simple patterns to address these issues that we face. So, where's that button? Excellent. That's a slide that says something about ethics. What's interesting, what's interesting, or that I've always found fascinating about looking at conservation and green movements and comparing that with permaculture is that we have an extremely strong ethical base to what we do. And it's a, those ethics also arise out of the understanding that we are not separate from nature. There's this ongoing debate in all kinds of in bio, biology and in anthropology and in sociology about this dichotomy of nature and culture, you know, and that our problems come actually from the fact that we see ourselves as separate. So what I love about the ethics is they put you straight back in your place. So the primary ethic of permaculture is. Earth care. <laughs> and the second ethic is? People care. People care. And what's the last one? Share surplus. Share surplus. So, and surplus is a very interesting concept because um, what we're doing is if we have surplus of anything, we reinvest it into earth care and people care. And the concept of surplus is not just extra stuff or extra money. It's also time, skills, love, patience, creativity. So anything that you have excess of is looped back into the system so that you're continuously feeding it. And there's a wonderful generosity within it and a fearlessness. There's not the sense of lack and too little. And that is really, really important. Okay. So that's the ethics in a nutshell. And you can have lots of fun and extrapolate them into all kinds of other things. And then if you look around you, you'll see that not only has permaculture as a design framework got an ethical base, it's also got a set of principles, all those pink hearts around the wall, that guide your decision making, they guide your application of action, they are assessment tools, um, and they are extrapolated from ecosystem processes. Um, and they can be applied not just to a garden, but across the board through business, through, to economics, to social structures, to education systems, uh, to buildings, to technology, and um, many other things. Mm. Right. <coughs> What's also interesting about permaculture as a design discipline, I've heard it called, is it's extremely multidisciplinary. So it draws on multiple influences. Sociology, geography, biology, um, community studies, ecological design, history, art, absolutely everything is woven into this core design that you're operating from. And that's also what makes it so interesting is that <coughs> I think a lot of people think, okay, permaculture is about gardening, but I, I actually don't like gardening. <laughs> you don't have to be a gardener. The world is not made up of gardeners. It's made up of multiple people playing multiple roles. And because of that wonderful interdisciplinary nature of it, you can find a place inside this this framework. So the first principle is observe and interact. And this is a very important one because a lot of what we're doing is we, 
understanding our situation better, we're understanding our context better, we're understanding people better, we're getting to know our ecosystems better, and through that growing of knowledge and taking time to do it, we can interact more effectively with our environments. And there's a lovely little corollary at the bottom that says beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And for me, that's all about perception. It's how you feel and how you see yourself in the world is going to shape what you see. Do you know what, do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of this today for me is about how we identify ourselves inside us. Very, very important. And how we shift into new identities. Um, the observe and interact for me is very interesting because a lot of the people work that I've done where I've been sent off by government departments to go and work in remote rural areas have never given me enough time. And they haven't given the people I've worked with enough time. And what's quite frustrating there is you come with this vision and you come with the authenticity of having lived inside these frameworks and you inspire people and then you leave. And, then there's, and there's no matrix to hold them in this transformation space. Is that making sense? Okay. I'm trying not to be too fluffy. But sometimes it comes out that way. Okay. So it's about data collection and it's about perception and it's about time. Then another principle which you'll see on the wall is catch and store energy. And that, that, the icon for that is beautiful. Oh, by the way, these come out of <coughs> David Holmgren's work. He was uh, Bill Mollison's co-author. And he <coughs> redefined and crystallized some of these principles into something a bit more broad. <coughs> catch and store energy is lovely. It's a glass jar with the sunshine inside it. And that takes us back to the fact that absolutely all life forms here are dependent on solar energy. And that the most important life forms that are around us are the plants because they're the only ones who can eat sunshine. So that we can eat sunshine. So part of your thinking in the design is what's happening to the sunshine in my system. Am I getting it to work? Am I losing sunshine? Am I allowing entropy to happen or am I creating what we call ecotropy? Am I cycling energy? So catching and storing energy means that you are making it available to do work later. EK, from when you did science, some of us? Kinetic energy, the ability to do work. A lot of our design is around making sure that energy is continuously available and not degrading so that it can take whatever system you're designing, whether it's financial or gardening, to a higher state where more energy is available. Is that too abstract or is that clear? Yeah. Good. Okay. And the corollary for that is make hay while the sun shines, so don't lose out on opportunities. Um, there's a beautiful knowledge opportunity sitting here. There's a networking opportunity. There is a genetic base sharing opportunity sitting here in this group of people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about seed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty of that. Sorry. <laughs> gathering too to mobilize the Permaculture Association of South Africa. Because you're all here. Excellent. And then another really pragmatic principle is obtain yield, get results. Don't design for nothing, it's design for some level of success because you need a positive feedback loop if you want to carry on. You want to, especially if you're going to something new and challenging, you want, you want positive feedback that's going to keep you going. So your design is around yield, but then the concept of yield also shifts. A lot of us who land up in um, more rural spaces in permaculture, one of our primary yields that we design for is ecosystem restoration. You might not eat for a while, but you've been digging a lot of swales and doing a lot of earthworks and watching the biosphere around you recover <laughs> to a point where it can actually support the rather soft endeavors that you're trying to engage with. And I come from the Clan Peru, so it's quite you know, rough and tough out there spiky and dry. So this concept of designing for yield is really, really important and it's a broadening of the understanding of yield. One of the most important yields is also that we have people who are empowered and satisfied, generous, able, dignified within our permaculture designs. One of the strongest lessons I think we learned from our community is you can have the kick assist permaculture implementation on the planet, but if your social stuff is not intact or operational, what does it matter? 